Okay. I think the voice is absolutely incredible. I know you've been asked about that before and you, you listen to audio of his voice, but I'm wondering, were there certain things that you latched onto about it, certain words that helped you get into it, and did you stay in it during production even when the camera cut? Uh, good question. Um, I don't think I stayed totally in it, but I don't know if I came totally out of it either. I, mm. I, I didn't necessarily think about it that way as much as, because it, it's, it's a physical thing, so um, you just kind of get in a habit, I guess. Right. Uh, were there particular things? I don't know. I, I don't know if I analyzed it that specifically mm. as much as just listen to it a lot and then kind of repeated it. Hmm. And I don't want to sound ignorant because I don't really know how the legality of this works, but when you go to meet with someone like Snowden, uh, and obviously I know you spent four hours with him initially and him and Lindsay were there, how does it work? Are you Do you know where you're going? Does does does, Ed, does uh, Oliver Stone go with you? Like, wh how did, What was the process like getting to him? Yeah, I, I didn't know where I was going, um, but uh, we uh, met up with um, uh, Mr. Kucherenya, who's his uh, right. lawyer in Russia, um, and uh, he arranged to drive us to, you know, an office. Are you blindfolded? Where... Do you know where you're going? No, no. Okay, I okay. <laughs> it was just, it, 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 again, it wasn't where uh, Edward Snowden lives. We hmm. just met at a, a an office. Wow. Um, yeah. So I mean, it it wasn't honestly that. Um, that crazy as far as the logistics. It wasn't it like goes. a Christopher Nolan script being delivered <laughs> to you. When you agree with someone you're playing, let's say you didn't agree with them, mm -hmm. is it harder to get into character? Is it easier to play someone you agree with? And w would the process be different if you didn't agree with him? Sure. Um, well, different in certain ways, and and then the same in other ways. I mean, I've I've played bad people. <laughs> you know, mm. I've, I've played. Uh, I was in a movie called Kill Shot where I was a complete sociopathic murderer. Mm. Um, but he didn't think that, you know, the character of Richie Nix in, in Killshot thinks he's fucking great, you know. <laughs> so uh, so you have to believe that. Um, I heard someone once describe it, you kind of look at your character as if you're their mom. Hmm. Uh, you know, a mother loves their child no matter what. Yeah. Uh, but I actually think the more helpful thing is just looking at, at the person as if it's you. you it's, it's really just about putting yourself in those shoes. So as you're sitting there, I mean, there's so many things you can learn about him and, and, and pick up on his mannerisms. What were things that fascinated you the most in regards to, like, what are some of his interests? Like, had, had he seen your movies? Does he, did he know about your career? Like, what, does he like TV shows? Well, like, mm -hmm. What things did he say to you in regards to that? Did you guys even speak on that? Yeah, yeah, but um, the, first, the first thing he asked me actually was, maybe you can settle a dispute that Lindsay and I are having. Is it Hit record or hit record? <laughs> record? He actually asked me that. I was like, oh man, I'm so stoked you asked me that. It's both, it's both, it's play on words. Uh, but I was, uh, he, he does his research. He's the kind of guy I think that reads a lot. Did he ask about the ending of Inception? He's like, does, does the thing keep spinning? <laughs> he did not ask I wanna that. know what his thoughts on that yeah, are. <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah. I wonder if he's seen that. I don't think he watches a lot of fiction movies. Now obviously you shot some scenes in DC and I'm wondering like, when you actually get to be on a location where the scene is really taking place, what does that do for you as an actor? Like, is it, is it, is it like obviously walking near the White House, is that completely change the way? Cause obviously you can be on green screens, blue screens. How does that make you feel as an actor to be on the location? It was trippy. I mean, being in DC, I like get goosebumps and tear up every time I think. To film a movie about Edward Snowden in front of the White House yeah. was a moment I will never, ever forget. And being someone who is actively involved with grassroots efforts, there's a lot of protests that happen outside the White House that I've been a part of. And walking down that lane um, in costume and in makeup with microphones with Joe playing Edward Snowden's girlfriend, <laughs> pretending to like walk past a protest for the Iraq war or against the Iraq war. You sign something. Yeah. yeah, it's just that, that it was so trippy. I still think every time I go to DC, I think about that moment. I think that's one of the greatest um, still frames in my mind from my entire career and what I've been fortunate enough to witness. That was a really special moment. I, I saw that you actually met Lindsay in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Um, how far, because I actually saw you guys filming down in that on that street. Yeah. I'm wondering what, like where you met her. Was it something private? Like how, how did you guys meet up? How did that work? She came to set one day and then we went to dinner afterwards with her, uh, Joe and I. And um, 
you know, it's it's an interesting experience that I had never had before playing someone who is a real human and then meeting them after you had already sort of concreted who they were based on your interpretation of who you thought they were. Mm. So there's a certain nerve factor in that because, of course, I wanted to impress her in a way by being, or not impress her, but I wanted her to know that I was trying to pay homage to who she is as a human outside of this fictitious sort of Hollywood world. Did you alter anything at all after you met her? Like, if I watched the movie again, could I see a change of when you... No, because I we were already three months into filming. We already done so much of the work. We really mm. only had the Hawaii scenes to do that... I felt like if I changed anything, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be linear and it wouldn't match up to what I had already been doing. But after I met her, I was like, dang, I wish I had met her earlier because there's certain physicalities that she possesses that I would have incorporated into the role. That's so interesting. I think you did a phenomenal job. But see, I think oh, I don't know much about her, so I, I don't think anybody watching yeah. the movie is even going to notice that. Oh, it's not about them. Yeah. It's about her. I was just like, yeah. oh, I hope you know I tried my hardest. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did a wonderful job. As an actress, as a person, like when you play somebody in a movie and you agree with that person or you're agreeing with what that person's doing, is that easier to get into the role? Like, is, it, is it easier to play that part? Because I know your character doesn't know what's going on, but is that easier? Um, to, yeah, I mean... Absolutely. I I don't know that if I if I didn't like Snowden or if I didn't agree with what he did, I don't know that I would have been able to do this movie. Mm. Um, only because, you know, I I tend to choose movies that are similar to like my own belief system. But what I do love about this movie, and maybe actually that completely counteracts what I just said, is this movie isn't biased. You don't leave the theater going, oh, Oliver Stone wants us to believe that he's a hero or he's a traitor or that he did the good thing or a bad thing. You leave the theater going, huh, I never knew that part of it. Hmm. I didn't know that Edward used to be, you know, he preferred to be in the military and then couldn't be in the military because of A, B, and C reasons. I didn't know that he was a conservative for a very long Neither time. Neither did I. That yeah, was a great so scene, yeah. These are things that, you know, we don't necessarily know about the human behind the face we see on the cover of all these newspapers. Uh, where are you from? I'm from Washington, D.C. And uh, where'd you get the Ralph Nader suit? <laughs> I, I, this is from, uh, Z it's from Zara. It's from Zara. I like your suit, though. Where's your suit from? Uh, what is it, 45 bucks? This, this cost me 170 bucks. That's the problem. But I like the look on you. <laughs> I, we, we should we'll narrow the pelt. We'll switch suits sometime, sir. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, by and the, the way. the tie clip is cool, man. That's out of the fucking, out of 1950s Wonderland. Are you a Breaking Bad fan? Oh, fuck. I ain't no. Oh, no. No, is that from that? Oh, I yeah. thought it was because you were cool. <laughs> hey, hey, Heisenberg, man. So Come you're on. a high school uh, science teacher. Got it. That's, Let's go. This is true. Nice to meet you, by the way. How are you doing? Kevin, hello. Yes, good to see you. I have to I ask you. I love your tie clip. Thank you very much. I love your suit. <laughs> <laughs> I like yours is Elvis Costello or this, something, this 80s. Is, you're amazing. Oh, can, we be, can we be best friends? I want to be best friends with you. <laughs> I think you'd be fun. I, I think you'd be fun. <laughs> now, I do want to ask you, because I've been watching your films all my life, obviously, Platoon, JFK, Nixon, everything born on the 4th of July, you can actually see comparisons of that film and this film with the story arc of the character. And I'm wondering though, when you were shooting those movies, you were shooting on film back then. Yeah. This is your first movie ever shot completely digital. Completely digital, And yes. I'm wondering how that affected you as a filmmaker. With Anthony Dodd Mantle, who I wanted to work with a long time ago, he had done uh, Slumdog Millionaire, yeah. plus Rush. You've got to see his work. You know, he's a under... Uh, Underpraised uh, DP from uh, Britain, and he work, lives in Denmark. Anyway, he shot this movie. On, he convinced me to go full out, and some of it in 65 millimeter, which gave us a lot more latitude and resolution. And I'm very pleased with the result. There's a little difference still, but it's close to a narrow point where it doesn't matter to me. Mm. Uh, some people care. I think the projection for digital is much more consistent through the United States, although they're still cheap, the theaters. They, tum they, they drive me crazy. You ever go to the theaters? Yeah. The bulbs are still, yep. they're dark sometimes. It's very upsetting. And then they, they leave a 3D and they, they project on a 3D machine and it changes the tonality of it. There's all these sound. They lower the sound. Every theater owner, right. like, your crowd should get upset about the way the theater owners, I, I go to movies I can't hear, I have to lean forward because some old biddy doesn't like the sound. Like, so <laughs> one person in the, or else to bleed through from the walls. Yeah. Get on it. You're talking to a film fan, somebody yeah. who actually yeah. appreciates we the We want film. to go to theaters yeah. to see films well projected, and that's disgusting sometimes. Yeah. You're going through a 10-year period with this storyline, and you say it's a dramatization of those 10 yes. years. 
as a filmmaker, where is the line of crossing into fiction versus nonfiction? How do you know where to stretch and where to keep reading? I have always asked that question on every movie, but I have never against, never in my knowledge of the thing, gone against what I see as the truth. Mm. In other words, I've tried to stay true to it, although you have to use parallel techniques. Among them, you're using an actor to play, you, you have decor, you have sets. The whole thing is, a, is an illusion, mm. but you're bringing together all these people, all this energy to give you a simulation of what happened. Wow. I could talk to you all. I had so many questions yeah, for you. Yeah, but I, I know. To you. you give him another six minutes, can't we? Uh, Please. <laughs> I like this guy. Oh, wait, wait. We don't need, um, okay. I don't need okay. six minutes. Get, but I can, uh, all right, three. You uh, okay. To sit here across from you is very fascinating to me because I grew up a film fan. And uh, when you were shooting this movie in DC, I actually remember taking an Uber to get down to the street to find you guys when you guys were shooting it. And when I watched the film, I'm seeing these sequences in Washington, DC, them walking in front of the White House. As a director, when you can put your characters in, in the actual spot. Do you imagine what does that mean to on you? that day saying, here we are, we're passing, they was making this movie that Obama hates this guy. <laughs> right. And we're walking right in front of his house <laughs> with the two, with the, with, the, with the man himself, or pretending to be. Right. He was pretty hairy, but I wanted to make sure, you know, we were always worried about the NSA and about the problems that could happen. We moved to Germany. So here we come back to the United States. We visit for one week and we go right in front of the White House. Why not find out if there's going to be a problem? And that was a smart move because they would have said something if it was a problem. Wow. They would have prevented it. But uh, it went on. Although there was an emergency that day, actually Washington blacked out and we got thrown off You're for right. about two hours and we had to rush back, rush back to finish the day in time. So sometimes I feel that scene, one of the scenes is a little sloppy with the light because we were running out. Interesting. There's an incredible shot in the film, later on in the film, where you're outside of the hotel and you're peering through the window. And to me, that was the moment where I actually really looked like Edward Stoner. That was like the most incredible. So I'm wondering, like, as you shot the movie non-linearly, how did you get him to go to different, to look different at different times, like the beard growing out? And how did you do well, that? Well, he uh, certainly there was minimal changes compared to some of my other movies. So he, you know, he had a in his limited range. He knew when he wanted to go to the stubble. Mm. So we had to shoot accordingly because there's a certain period emotionally and then he frees up that he, the stubble is there. So, you know, we had to pay attention to those, but then those restrictions, by the comparison of my other films, are limited, uh, it's right. small. It was a tough film to shoot because there are so many different aspects to it. And it was a, a technically complicated, how do you make a computer movie? Let's be honest, mm -hmm. think about it. I mean, the guy, a code guy is not that interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, except for Enemy of the State and War Dog, uh, War, uh, War games. I don't yeah. remember some of the computer movies. That Love Enemy of the State. That's a good yeah, flick. But they have violence. They have uh, sure people are cracking. The government's ten, two inches behind you. The truth is, the government was not on his case. Mm. We thought he was. We we mentioned he, their fear of being broken into. They were not. They were kind of slow and stupid in this matter. Very slow. Mm. Even Snowden was surprised because he left clues, digital footprints, as he says in the movie, behind. And so how did they miss it? You know, it's not world, in other words, the NSA doesn't spend a lot of dough on technology. They, they, it's the, so they cut where they can. So some of these sets, some of these computers don't look as exotic as the ones in films. Mr. Stone, this has been one of the greatest honors of my life. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. I would, I would love to talk to you Well, guys. let's do it again. So, um, obviously, I love Oliver Stone, one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. Yeah. And I was reading that like the scripts were even like set in a certain way where they weren't like actually online. Did you deal with that at all in regards to like not seeing your script at all times? I heard it was set in pieces. Did you always get your full scripts? Uh, well, I don't remember that. Maybe I do remember something like that. I remember tell them telling me that I got the that I got the role, and I said, "Well, what role?" I just went and auditioned. I don't even remember what I auditioned for. And they said, "Well, he, he wants you in the film." And I said, "Okay." And then they there was no script or anything for me to read, so I went the first day. And I remember Joseph Gordon-Levitt saying, "So, uh, wait, which role do you play in the film?" And I said, "I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I." I I don't know, I hope a good one. <laughs> when you leave a project, I mean, obviously you've played, I've, I love doing the roles you've played so far and I can't wait to see you in Fast 8. I'm so excited about that. Nice. I'm geeking out beyond belief. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering, like, do characters ever stay with you? Like, do you, like, when you leave a project, do people ever stay with you, like the characters? Do you play any characteristics? I, I let them go. I shake them. Hmm. I try to, okay, on to the next, something new that it will excite me, something new that will, 
inspire, you know, be creative. Now, obviously, um, I mentioned your dad before I went in the interview. I mean, I'm yep. one of the best actors and directors of all time. Yep. I was wondering, was there ever a particular film of his that made you want to act? Was there one, or was it just a just a collective of all the films? It must have been a collective. I really, really liked uh, Unforgiven. <laughs> Dude, I love that movie, man. That it's, a, it's an amazing film. That was a good one. What was it about that movie that made you want to uh, act, though? Was it about what was it about it? Well, it was that was sort of a, an amalgamation of his whole career, mm. and then him looking back as a character that had a regret about some of the things he did, and it was sort of you know this gunslinger being called back and the one last thing being forced to go back. But it was it, the character was amazing. It was, it was a character who had lost his wife, who was trying to change as a, as a man, yeah. and and gets called back, and is sort of in a self-reflecting point of his life. Mm. I always found found that character that character to be fascinating. Yeah. You know, for me, the sign of a great film is when you can watch it and fully suspend your disbelief in the story, but also notice some of the filmmaking techniques, the way things are shot, the score. And there's a moment in this movie that for some reason I, I walked away thinking about is when you were yelling at the computer screen, mm -hmm. a little bit of spit comes out of your mouth mm. during that scene. And I'm wondering, was that was that something that you planned on? Was that completely, did that just happen? I planned the, the spit, spit, man. You planned it, I, I knew it. planned it, the whole, <laughs> my entire performance in the movie is was based. The spit. I know. When you asked me to come watch you spit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah I, because I, I, I was really, oh, I was I was, I was joking. No, I was working. I know it's a ridiculous question, but I'm actually curious. Art. No, I mean... <laughs> I'm being curious. I'm being mixed curious. No, no. I mean, I think in in certain moments like that, um, and that's the cool thing about film, actually, mm -hmm. is uh, you know that uh, things can take you by surprise. Things can happen that you don't expect to have happen, uh, and and depending on how connected you are to a character or to a moment, it can either throw you or uh, undermine what you had planned to do, or it can just enhance. There's a my, one of my favorite examples of this is in uh, in the movie You Can Count on Me with Mark Ruffalo and Laura Linney, and they're having a scene outside. I think they're passing a joint back and forth between one another, and this fly comes in and starts buzzing around them. And the way that Mark deals with the fly in the scene, Improving. like improv yeah. his relationship to this thing was so rooted in their relationship and in their moment, and, the, and, and it was just... You could see that both of these actors were informed by this intrusion on the work that they were doing, mm. and um, to see how they kind of absorbed it and dealt with it was pretty amazing. Of course, we're not talking about you can count on me. We're no, I know. About but I, 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 didn't I just mean thought it was an interesting thing. Course, I noticed it. Yes. I was like, wow, he was like really into that moment. Yeah, like, yeah and that's I, just sort of yeah. like you know you roll with it and and uh, hope that it somehow enhances a, a, a performance. But for an editor and a director later in post production process, like Oliver might say, like that brings something look at that moment yeah. that nobody expected and you know that's it, why they choose that take perhaps it was powerful that to me meant like your character was completely mm. into what he mm. was doing you know I, I, there's a powerful line i know it's a ridiculous question but there's a powerful it's good. line no it's a very interesting acting proposition mm -hmm. there's a powerful line in the movie about uh, americans don't want freedom they want security and i thought that was interesting corbin says that to snowden at one point like what do you make of that line in regards to like how we act as a country in regards to, do you think we really rely more on, on uh, security than freedom? I mean, I think... <sighs> it's a deep question, but yes. What do you think? I think it's, we're in some really serious trouble and there's semantics that get thrown about, about it. I think every human being on the planet wants the same thing, and that's to live a peaceful life and raise their children in the beliefs that they hold dear, whoever they are, wherever they are. And it's, you know, freedom, security, whatever. That's mm. just blah, 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 blah. Mm. 